Good morning and thank you to everyone joining us today. We welcome you to the second in the series of webinars, um, I apologize, third in the series of webinars presented in conjunction with the Indian Heritage Center's um, Sikhs in Singapore special exhibition. This exhibition has been co-created with the Sikh community and focuses on the history and culture of Singapore Sikhs. To complement the exhibition, this series of webinars introduces various facets of the Sikh community's heritage from the Indian subcontinent and Singapore. Academics and experts share lesser known aspects of the community's history and culture through these talks, which are held every month. Today, we are very fortunate to be joined by Sonia Dhami, who's trustee of the Sikh Foundation, um, who will be speaking about Sikh art and its evolution. The talk is entitled Sikh Art from the Kapani Collection, and Sonia will be showcasing a selection of masterpieces and treasures from the famed Kapani collection of Sikh art, introducing the range and breadth of Sikh artistic expression over its 550 year history. The collection introduces beautiful portraits of the Sikh gurus, illustrated manuscripts, spectacular paintings of the golden temple, royal arts and treasures of Sikh Maharajas, arms and armaments, coinage, stamps, textiles, and contemporary arts. Sonia, Sonia Dhami is a trustee of the Sikh Foundation and CEO of Art and Tolerance. She is also co-editor of Sikh Art from the Kapani Collection, which is a definitive volume on Sikh art, co-published with the Smithsonian Institution, and has also edited a richly illustrated volume, Games We Play. Her work demonstrates the confluence of art, history, religion, and community. We are also joined today by Simranjit Singh, who will act as a respondent to Sonia's presentation. Simran is a, a well-known uh, member of Singapore Sikh community. He uh, is an active volunteer and a well-known face um, and currently serves on the Central Sikh Gurdwara Board as well as the Sikh Advisory Board. Um, Simran, um, in a professional capacity, of course, is the CEO of Gardon Health Asia, Middle East and Africa. Um, he also sits on the board of the Oversight Committee for the National Health Innovation uh, under the Ministry of Health. Um, Simran uh, was also an execu executive producer for an award-winning documentary, The Same Soldier, The Story of the First Sikh in Singapore, Bhai Maharaj Singh. Um, we would like to invite Simran um, to represent the Sikh community in Singapore's voice um, in terms of responding to uh, Sonia's, Sonia's sharing of the famed Kapani collection um, and to tie in the importance of these kind of international collections um, and how, how uh, the impact that they have on uh, Sikh diasporas across the world and of course in Singapore as well. Moderating the discussion after the talk, we have Nalina Gopal, who's the curator, uh, the lead curator at the Indian Heritage Center, uh, who will be uh, moderating the Q&A later. Uh, so please save your questions for after the presentation. Uh, you can submit any questions you have in the Q&A using the Q&A button that you see at the bottom of your screen. So without much further ado, uh, let me invite Sonia uh, to begin uh, the presentation this morning. Malvika? Yes, Sonia. Okay, yeah. So, so thank you very much for, it's great to be here today and uh, an honor to have another opportunity to share the spectacular collection of Sikh art with audiences around the world. And especially reaching audiences in Singapore is special. So uh, can I start to share the screen now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yes. So here we go. I need to. So. Okay. Can you see that? The titles page? Yes, Sonia, we can see your screen. All right. So I think there's a little lag between uh, Singapore and California. So, <laughs> so greetings from California to all audiences. Uh, but before I begin, I'd like to share with you a story. And this story starts in the town of Patiala with a grandmother lovingly called Manji. 
by her 10 year old grandson who spends the long summer afternoons with her. So every afternoon after finishing her day's work, Manji would gather around her, the women of the neighborhood. They would sit on the floor of the courtyard uh, of the house and Manji would bring out this old family manuscript, which is called a Janam Sakhi. Now, a Janam Sakhi is a book which contains the life stories of Guru Nanak, who was the founder of the Sikh faith. And this particular Janam Sakhi had been commissioned by her family some hundred years prior to that time. Now her ancestor had been uh, the head of the Patna Sahib Gurdwara, which is in Bihar. Now Manji is a skilled storyteller. Her voice is melodic and full of life, as are the stories that she reads, which are animated and colorful in their tone and descriptions. These stories are also brilliantly illustrated with magnificent paintings, such as this one that we see here, this brilliantly colored folio of Guru Nanak, who is visiting his elder sister, Bibi Nanki. So Manji would read the story first, and then she would carefully pass around, urging each one to look at the paintings and to touch the pages so as to commune with the Guru's life in that moment. So each afternoon, a different story would be told. Now, while the stories in the Janan Sakhis are exaggerated to deepen the belief of the faithful, and they mostly end on these miraculous outcomes, Guru Nanak watering his fields from thousands of miles away from Haridwar, or Guru Nanak turning the Kaaba with his magical powers and so on and so forth. But the legacy that this manuscript ensured is nothing short of a miracle. The 10 year old boy who was part of these animated storytelling sessions is Narinder Singh Kapani. And he eventually inherits this manuscript and it inspires the Kapanis to gather the spectacular collection of Sikh art. Today, these brilliantly colored paintings occupy a place of pride at the acclaimed Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. So this is the story of how this fabulous collection all began. It began with a woman because it is they who are the custodians of stories in our families. Now, the renowned Kapani collection of Sikh art has been lovingly put together over many, many years by Satinder Kaur and Narinder Singh Kapani. And I had the honor to co-edit with the distinguished Dr. Paul Michael Taylor, the volume which documents the wide range and the depth of Sikh artistic expression over its 550 year history. The volume was co-published with the Smithsonian and the first edition was published in 2017. And I'm very delighted to inform you that now a 2021 edition is out as well and is available online. It was the opportunity to work on this book that enabled me to get a first-hand look at the artworks in the collection. And this has greatly influenced my understanding of my own community's artistic traditions and heritage and made me realize that contrary to the untrue but popular narrative, Sikhs have an artistic tradition that goes back five centuries starting with the gurus themselves. And this is the understanding that I hope to share with you today. 
So I would like to continue looking at a few other paintings of Guru Nanak, which is from the collection. And how I've structured the presentation today is I've divided it into two parts. The first part, we look at only the paintings of Guru Nanak, continuing uh, what we've been talking about now. And then in the second part, I will try to place the artworks in a chronological manner, starting with the period in which they belong. So uh, let's look at this painting, which is an 18th century portrait. And we see a pious elderly man who is reading from a small book. And judging by his headgear, he might be a Muslim peer or a saint. But when we read the inscription on the top of the painting, which you can see on this full painting that I've added uh, on the right-hand side, the inscription reads, the Svir e Darvesh Nanak Shahi. Now the Asian Art Museum has interpreted this portrait of Guru Nanak as a portrait of Guru Nanak himself but it can also be a portrait of a follower of Nanak, who were known as the Nanak Shahis or the Nanak Panthis. And since this painting comes from Lucknow or Faizabad or the Murshidabad school, sorry, we can safely guess that it was maybe painted by a Muslim artist who has depicted the guru or his follower in his vision of a holy man. Now, in another 19th century painting, we see a richly colored miniature of Guru Nanak, who's centrally placed, sitting on a raised stool and reading, or perhaps singing from a red book held high in his left hand, which is resting on a sadhu staff, while Pai Mardana, his companion, plays the rabab and a devotee reverently waves a peacock feather whisk over the guru. Now, this time, the guru appears as a saint or a sadhu from the Hindu tradition, as indicated by the tilak marking on his forehead, the bairagi under his arm, and his yellow robes. Perhaps here the artist was a Hindu, and he has painted Guru Nanak in his vision of a holy man. So what does Guru Nanak look like? And the fact is that we might never know, since there is no portrait of Guru Nanak that was made during his lifetime. Now, in this painting, which is in the traditional representational style by the 20th century popular Sikh artist, Sardar Shobha Singh, who yet again paints guru, the Guru differently but someone we can finally recognize as a Sikh of today. Shobha Singh has said that this portrait is a manifestation of his meditations and devotions to the Guru. Except for the halo, which signifies divinity, Guru Nanak now looks like a grandfatherly Sikh of our time. As we move further into the 21st century, Arupana Kaur, a leading Indian contemporary artist whose works are very well represented in the collection. She paints Guru Nanak in an expressionist style. And this painting depicts the Sakhi of his encounter with Vali Gandhari at Hassan Abdal in Pakistan. So having now looked at the different styles of paintings of the first guru, we can safely say that these are not representations of the historic Guru Nanak, but a man of that time and society. Painted by different artists from different backgrounds and faiths, just as they envision him to be and how they think Guru Nanak looked. So we find that if the artist is a Hindu, she imagines him as a sadhu from the Hindu tradition. If the artist is Muslim, 
he imagines him like a Muslim peer. And for me, this is the timeless beauty and aesthetic of the visual memory of Guru Nanak. He is as you imagine him to be. Nanak Shah Fakir, Hindu ka guru, Musalman ka peer. This is how the world loves and experiences Baba Nanak. And I have learned this important lesson, I believe, by looking at the paintings in the Kapani collection, reminding me how important it is to have an understanding of art, to really understand our history and our shared heritage. Because art is another way to understand history and our roots. And when I look at the individual pieces in the collection, I can see our history reflected in them. And this is how I will attempt to share the highlights of the entire Kapani collection with you today, by placing the artwork in its rightful chronological period so that we can understand the development of Sikh history as we look at the developing art around it. And this is how I've structured the rest of the presentation and I found it useful to divide the time period so far into five different categories. Uh, the first is the Guru period, which encompasses the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries, the period of our 10 Gurus. Uh, the 18th century is the Missal period. It is the time uh, after the death of the 10th Guru and a period of evolution of the Sikh community, which is now guided by the Shri Guru Granth Sahib, which is ordained as the eternal Guru. And then we follow it up with the 19th century, which is the Sikh Maharajas, the British rule, and then so on and so forth. Now, starting with the Guru period, this is one of the oldest dated paintings from the collection and has been identified by the Asian Art Museum as a portrait of Guru Tegh Bahadur dated to 1670. This is a very important painting because it is a rare contemporary portrait of the Guru, meaning that it is a painting done during his lifetime. And from the date 1670, we realize that only five years after the painting is made, the Guru is martyred. He is shown dressed in this bright orange jama. The Guru holds a hawk in his gloved hand and stands like a beacon in a broad brushed green background that is characteristic of the 17th century Mughal school of painting. The quiet heroism of Guru Tegh Bahadur is captured in this evocative painting. Now, moving to the 18th century, after the death of Guru Gobind Singh in 1708 and subsequently of Banda Singh Bahadur, the Punjab is plunged further into turmoil. Persecuted by the Mughal rulers, the Khalsas organized themselves into 12 missiles or the confederacies. And this was a time when the Sikhs did not even have a home. They lived in the jungles fighting and on the moon. There was literally a price on each Sikh head. And because of these unsettling times, we understandably don't have a lot of art surviving from the 17th century. But some manuscripts and paintings have survived and they include this fine portrait of Guru Hargobind standing on a carpeted terrace. The style of this painting is Mughal because the artists were mainly trained in this style and many of them after losing Royal Mughal patronage under Aurangzeb moved to the courts of the Rajas of the Punjab plains and hills. Now this painting is an idealized rendering of the Guru and is identified from an inscription on the back of the painting. And it is a part of a group of paintings dating to 1731 to 1751, making it one of the early documents of painting in the Punjab. 
Now, towards the end of the 18th century, the tables have turned. The declining Mughal authority was balanced by the rising power of the Sikh missiles, who now controlled vast territories in the Punjab. The Bhangi missile took control of Lahore in 1765, and it immediately struck their coins as a mark of sovereignty. And they used a Persian couplet from the seal of Guru Gobind Singh, which read, Deg teg o fateh nusrat be derang, yaft az nanak Guru Gobind Singh. Translated as, abundance the sword, victory and health without delay, Guru Gobind Singh obtained from Nanak. Sikh coinage is also called Nanak Shahi because it is unique in not being struck in the name of the ruler or the emperor, but in the name of Guru Nanak. It bears elegant motifs of leaves, as we see of the, in this picture of the coin from the Amritsar Mint of 1791, while others had motifs of flowers, sunbursts, branches, trishuls, swords, etc. So with the advent of the 19th century, that heralded in a new era in Sikh history. Ranjit Singh becomes Maharaja and the Lahore Darbar starts to consolidate the warring Sikh missiles to create the first indigenous empire in the Punjab, which would effectively stop all foreign invasions from the left, from the West, which had plagued the Indian heartland unchecked for 800 years. And this has an enduring effect on the arts that we see flourishing in the Punjab, not just in Ranjit Singh's domains, but also in the cis Satluj states of Patiala, Nava, Jing, Kabul. Now the next 50 years could be said as the golden period of Sikh arts. The patronage of Maharaja Ranjit Singh spurs shawl and carpet production in the Kashmir. Miniature paintings flourished, coins were minted, illustrated manuscripts were created, fine arms and armaments were forged, jewelry, jewels, metal engravings of the highest quality as seen in the golden temple, frescoes, paintings, adorned monuments and a distinguished style of Sikh architecture is emerging. And the Kapani collection is particularly very strong in this period. And I'd like to share a sampling of the high quality of work that is now being produced in the Punjab itself. This magnificent emerald ring belonged to Maharaja Ranjit Singh and was used to seal his documents. It is now on display at the Asian Art Museum. Now, through military conquest, the Sikh Empire at its zenith extended up to the Khyber Pass in the Northwest, uh, to Kashmir, Ladakh and Punjab Hills in the Northeast, up to Sindh and Rajputana in the South and the Suleiman Ranges in the West. Military discipline and pride are perfectly evoked in the exquisite artistry of this 19th century steel helmet overlaid with gold. Uniquely designed to accommodate the Sikh turban or the top knot. And if you are in Singapore, you can see this uh, a similar magnificent piece, which is currently a part of the Singapore exhibit as well. This is an early 19th century painting. Now, by this time, Ranjit Singh had gained domination and annexed the Rajput Hill states of Kangra, Chamba, Basoli, Mandi, etc. And the famed Pahari artists are now serving new patrons. This painting from the workshop of Purku of Kangra depicts all the 10 gurus as well as the two famous companions of Guru Nanak, Pai Bala and Pai Mardana with the Rabab, highlighting the centrality of music in the Sikh tradition. 
Now the name of each guru is inscribed in Gurmukhi script uh, just below the painting, the portrait. And Guru Gobind Singh is shown with his four sons. And this occupies a central position in the frame. Now, there, are, there is a very interesting ways in which artists have included subtle symbolism and messages in their works. For example, in this painting, you will note that only some of the gurus have a book placed in front of them. The artist is indicating with this symbolism, those gurus whose writings and verses are enshrined in the Guru Granth Sahib. So we see that, you know, paintings, they show us way more than just colors or figures. They can pack in a lot of other information as well, whether it is about the textiles, the styles, the power equations, the clothes, the musical instruments, and so on and so forth. This is painting of Guru Gobind Singh, it is dated to 1830. And the Guru is shown set amidst a verdant green landscape of rolling hills. He's astride his blue stallion with his hawk and sword and is flanked by three attendants. The Guru is shown dressed in fine clothes, sporting a sword adorned with jewelry and a kalgi on his turban. He holds the reins of his horse on which is perched his white hawk. And it reminds me of the epithet that we give for Guru Gobind Singh, Chitiya Bajamala, or the one who owns the white hawks. The artist has again drawn a halo around his head, which signifies his high spiritual position. This is an exquisite example of the fine workmanship of the artists under the patronage of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. We see the Maharaja sitting opposite his favorite courtier, Raja Hira Singh. And they're both sitting on these European styled chairs and it is through the symbolism of the chairs that the artist has shown the difference in their social and power status. The Maharaja's chair appears bigger and has a footstool in front, while that of Hira Singh is a smaller chair. So this is another example of how artists put in subtle messages in their creations to convey meaning without using words. This is another work of the Pahari artists from the same time period, and it shows a hunting party it is armed with matchlocks, spears, swords. A prince or a high official takes aim from the raised platform. And in the background of the painting on the top left and the right, uh, we see groups of drum beaters whose job was to round up the wildlife for the shoot. Now, all in all, it's a pretty gruesome scene with bloodied animals. Uh, on the top, you can see a deer, then you see a doe and a fawn. Um, then you see injured men, uh, which who are being gored by the wild boars, which is uh, right in kind of in the center of the, of the painting. And so, but what is remarkable is the complexity of the composition and the expert rendering. we move on to this portrait and we see that the grandeur of the Sikh kingdoms starts to attract artists and travelers from other parts of the world, including Emily Eden, who's a gifted artist and a sister of the then Governor General of India. In 1836, she sketched Maharaja Ranjit Singh and a number of members of his court, including this portrait of Sher Singh, uh, which is part of a bound set of prints published in 1844 in London, wherein she writes that he appeared for his sitting all over diamonds and emeralds. 
Now her lithographs are tinged with a calm and a delicate appreciation of the characters and architecture. Now this marvelous I, watercolor on paper is a study of the Zamindars from Punjab. The date of the painting is 1817 and its striking resemblance to the paintings in the famous Fraser album remind us of William Fraser who traveled in the Punjab with artists in his entourage documenting the people he encountered at that time. Now, after the death of Ranjit Singh in 1839, the Punjab was again plunged into chaos and turmoil. There were four quick successions of Maharajas with Kharak Singh, Maharani Chand Kaur, Sher Singh, and finally, Dalip Singh, till the annexation of the Punjab by the British in 1849. The Russian prince, uh, Alexis Soltikov, visited the court, the Lahore court at the time of Maharaja Sher Singh. And he created some wildly and wonderfully romantic lithographs. They are full of tall, impressive Sikh warriors, some bearing standards and flags, dressed in silks and glittering with jewels, riding horses decorated with enormous rubies, emeralds, and pearls. Now, unlike Mara Ranjit Singh's kingdom, which turned into a bloodbath of warring Sikh factions after his death, and it made it easy prey for the British, the Sis Satluj states of the Fulkia kingdoms of Patiala, Naba, Faridkot, Jind, and Kapurthala, which are south of the Satluj River, did not fall to the British. They instead signed treaties which enabled them to keep their own courts and armies until India's independence in 1947. And it is here that business boomed for portraiture and courtly and military scene paintings. So we see here Ranjit Singh's contemporary, Maharaja Karam Singh of Patiala with his son Narinder Singh in full European military dress. Maharaja Narinder Singh was an acclaimed ruler of Patiala. And during his reign, artists came from far and wide to work in his court. And this painting shows the Maharaja not in the plains of Patiala, but in the hilly areas, riding up the ramparts of a fort on an elephant. And for once, we know the artist since the painting is signed, Bashrat Ullah, the artist, whose family had migrated from Lahore uh, looking for work in Patiala and the neighboring kingdoms. The Kapani collection has an interesting set, series of exquisite, large-sized, uh, miniature-style paintings. These are from the 1850s and they depict historical events. Uh, this painting is of Maharaja Sher Singh entertaining Dost Muhammad, the Amir of Kabul who is the only person in this painting seated on a chair, which suggests that the painting was commissioned not by a Sikh patron. And other paintings by the same artist are now dispersed in several collections, including the Aga Khan collection. This masterpiece from the Kapani collection shows the saint by Veer Singh at his riverside encampment. As we examine the details of the painting, we see an entire world of communal activity happening in this frame. There are men and women from different backgrounds. They're making offerings and paying their respects to the holy man. We can see a new bride being brought to seek his blessings. Food is being cooked. Guru Ka Langar is served to all people. And we also see people with various physical afflictions who have probably traveled here on hearing of the saint's arrival. And others are preparing uh, the intoxicant drink called Sukha in this whole melee of devotion and activity. 
actually, I mean, this is really one of my favorite paintings and we could just do a webinar on this one piece itself. Now, this is a delightful watercolor, full of life and exuberance and showing a wedding procession with the young groom astride his horse and the women of the household are shown behind a red parda uh, or a shawl or a curtain right next to the groom, while the dancers and musicians play in the foreground. Uh, we also see, you know, there's a group of young boys in the bottom right corner who are probably uh, making comments or looking at the young girls uh, in the center of the painting at the bottom. And so it's uh, a very lively scene uh, showing us the wedding procession. There are different types of musical instruments. There is the toll, the shenai, the big drums, which is mounted on a camel, uh, small uh, tablas, which, are, uh, which the musicians have wrapped around a cloth and uh, are playing it. There is a sarangi. So it's, it's really a fascinating uh, piece. And I must say that this was one of the uh, one of the favorite pieces of Dr. Kapani himself, and he really enjoyed telling the story and pointing out, especially uh, this old woman you see right at the bottom center, and who seems to be chiding the young girls, like you know, not to exchange glances with the with the boys on the other side. Uh, compared to the busyness of the previous uh, slide, we have one here. Uh, this painting is uh, from one of the albums which is displayed at the Singapore exhibit as well. So if you are in Singapore, please do make a point to check this out. And what we are seeing here is that uh, by the late 19th century, the artists are now serving new patrons. And these patrons are the British and the East India Company. Now the tourist minded Britons, they wish to take back with them scenes of the curious and the exotic East spawning a new genre of art called company art, which though is done by Indian artists, but took its stylistic cues from the uh, British Victorians. And one of the popular artworks are paintings like these which are part of albums or bound notebooks, each with 40 to 60 sketches and paintings like this one, which could be of past royalty, monuments of the Punjab, the shrines of Punjab, soldiers in their uniforms, vignettes of life of the common people, as we see in this folio, which shows the native doctor or, you know, Hakim, as we would call him, examining a child brought in by his mother. And so by now, Dilip Singh, the last Maharaja of the Punjab is living in England, where his mother Maharani Jind Kaur joins him in 1860. He commissions the artist George Richmond who impressively captures her beauty, daring and defiance which is the stuff of legends and folklore. The Maharani is wearing a blue and gold dress adorned with her fabulous jewels. And at the time of this portrait, she was almost blind with cataract and she was plagued with ill health and dies a year later at the young age of 46. And it is known that she sat very reluctantly for this portrait, though it is through this portrait that she is alive in our collective memories. And I think because of this, it's a very, very important painting, not just for its beauty, but also for the critical role it plays in reviving the memory of Maharani Jind Kaur in Sikh history. This necklace was one of the highlights of the collection and was shockingly went missing, presumably stolen while in transit to a museum for a display in 2015. I included this today just so that everyone is aware of this incident and can keep a lookout for whenever and wherever the necklace might resurface.
So while the traditional medium of Indian artists has been watercolors, the latter part of the 19th century saw many Sikh artists making the transition to oil paintings. And Kapoor Singh of Amritsar is one of the leading artists of that time. This painting of the Harmandar Sahib reflected in the Sarovar with a number of worshippers, including a Nihang in his blue bana and his distinctive headgear stand at the edge of the Sarovar and in the blue sky above, birds take flight. A very unusual pictorial Kirman rug from Iran shows Maharaja Sher Singh with his entourage. And now after this image, we will step into the next century, which is the beginning of the 20th century and is marked by the Great War of 1914. Six soldiers of the Indian British Army saw action in many parts of the world, including the Middle East, Europe, and Burma. Wherever the Sikh regiments were stationed, they carried with them the Guru Granth Sahib. And to facilitate easy transportation, miniature volumes of the Holy Scriptures were printed and distributed amongst the soldiers. Today, not many of the volumes survive and the Kapani collection has this unique uh, Shri Guru Granth Sahib along with a silver palki for its display and storage. The 20th century, it continues to attract artists from around the world to India. A Californian artist, Hubert J. Stowitz, travels across the length and breadth of India for two years, and he also visits Indonesia, and he paints 150 portraits. These are of musicians, dancers, craftsmen, common folks, and some royalty with the view of preserving and documenting a vanishing India due to the expanding industrial age. The Kapani collection has 50 of these paintings, including this work showing two young Sikh men busy in their laundry. Now, with the advent of the industrial age, the convenience of the printing press helps to cater a growing demand from the masses who also want to own and display art in their homes. So entrepreneurial publishers start to print calendars and posters for mass circulation, leading to a genre labeled as calendar art. Here we have Guru Gobind Singh in a 1950 poster image, which is sponsored by the Dunlop Corporation. The political and social reforms of the 20th century, the internationalization of the Sikh community, all bring changes to Sikh art. Gone is the grandeur and patronage of the royal courts. But Sikh art continues to flourish and indeed expand in its subject matter and the styles. And perhaps the most significant development of the 20th century is in the artists themselves. Not only are we now seeing the distinctive works of named artists, but we are seeing women artists, enabling us to see through the eyes of women. By 1980s, Arpana Kaur is making her mark on the Indian contemporary art scene. Through abstract figures, she interprets the stories from the Janam Sakis, Punjabi folklore, and she also comments very regularly on society and its ills. And in this painting, which is titled The Wounds of 1984, an elderly sick man stands half naked, half robed in a white cloth against a black background that casts a pall of endless night over the painting. He is watched by figures to the left who peer out of compartment-like buildings. And in the right panel, a seated woman, Arpana herself perhaps, holds up 
a blood-stained cloth that flows across the canvas like a silver river. And other contemporary artists with significant presence in the collection is Devendra Singh with over 50 paintings. His work is where his individual style marries uh, modern cubism with the traditional representational style. And this work is a part of a series of the great Sikh women and depicts Rani Sadapur, who was the leader of the Kanhaya Confederacy and was the mother-in-law of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And she plays a critical role in his rise as Maharaja. Artist Sukhpreet Singh from Ludhiana has created many delightful paintings reviving nostalgic memories of life in the towns and villages of Punjab. Here we see a young Sikh village boy tying his turban while balancing a small mirror between his knees. A scene of memory that many Sikh men remember fondly from their own childhood. This is a contemporary bronze sculpture of Maharaja Ranjit Singh on horseback and is a recent acquisition to the collection. This is a marble bust, again of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and even though it is a contemporary or modern piece, it holds tremendous appeal. And with this, we complete our journey, leafing through the fascinating collection of Sikh art and revisiting Sikh history through the lens of art. So we can see that the entire collection is deeply inspired by the teachings of the Sikh Gurus. And we have seen today beautiful portraits of the Gurus, illustrated manuscripts, spectacular paintings of the Golden Temple, royal arts and treasures of the Sikh Maharajas, arms and armaments, coins, stamps, textiles, uh, and contemporary arts. And through this collection, we are able to share our pride in our heritage with communities across the world and across barriers of language, color, race, and religion. And today, gifts from the collection are part of the permanent collections of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and very recently, the Montreal Museum of Fine Art in Montreal, Canada. Artworks are also loaned to museums for special exhibitions, just as we have for the exhibit here in Singapore. So far, 10 exhibits have been put up in the past 30 odd years, starting from 1991 to the last one in 2019, uh, when the first contemporary Sikh Art Museum exhibit opened here and this ongoing exhibit in Singapore, which, I, which is probably the first Sikh art exhibit in Asia outside of India. And I think this is a huge milestone and I congratulate the organizers, the curators, uh, Nalina Gopal and Malvika Agarwal for a successful and spectacular show. And a heartfelt congratulations and gratitude uh, to the Sikh community of Singapore for enabling and supporting this exhibit, uh, especially Amardeep Singh for putting us in touch. Now, as a community, we owe a huge gratitude to collectors who have put together spectacular collections providing us with a way to appreciate and understand our artistic heritage. And the Kapani collection is one of the most significant collections. And I will also respectfully take the liberty to share with you that the second edition of the book, Sikh Art from the Kapani collection has now been published and is available online. Uh, it is available in India on Amazon at the moment and will be in Singapore, uh, UK and US into, uh, in September. 
And in Singapore, the publishers, Roly Books, have mentioned that it will be at the Kino Kunia uh, bookstores. So uh, with this, I will leave you with a quote from Dr. Kapani himself. And I quote, we also need to ensure that our friends of other faiths, races, and cultures understand who and what we are. We must present the beauty of our heritage without chauvinism. The wisdom, philosophy, and the arts of the Sikh faith belong to the world, and it is time to bring them into the light." Unquote. Thank you very much. I will now stop uh, sharing. Thank you, Sonia. That was really an incredible journey through six centuries of Sikh art and history. Um, I would now like to invite our moderator, Nalina, and our respondent, Simran, to join us. Um, and for Simran to please respond to Sonia's presentation um, as, as uh, a representative of the Singapore Sikh community. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Malvika. And thank you, Sonia, for the amazing, amazing journey you brought us through. Um, I, I mean, I, I, let me start by saying, you know, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin and art and culture is a tree without roots. Sure. You know, I want to extend really our utmost gratitude and thanks to the Kapani collection for providing various invaluable pieces of their collection to the Sikhs in Singapore exhibition. It has definitely enriched the exhibition. And I'm being biased here, obviously, with a biased opinion as a fan of the collection. Um, it's definitely a key highlight of the exhibition for me. Um, you know, I, I wanted to start by, by first, we're just starting out from the onset of what you had said. And you started out with a very interesting story, which, which resonated with me as well. And, and, and the reason is very simply, you know, the story that you shared about the oral tradition, about storytelling, um, it's one that I, you know, it's so close because I, I, that was how I got in touch with Sikh history. It was my grandfather who used to share these stories. The old ladies in the Sikh temple, they used to share stories about the great gurus and the great Sikh saints. And, 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 and it was one that made the, made the religion or made Sikhism more, more appealing to, to you and made you identify yourself with the religion itself. And so, so you, you're absolutely right. That's the start point of, of that journey of, of discovery, I would say. And the journey that you had taken us throughout this, this almost an hour or so has gone through various different aspects of, of, of Sikh history. I mean, you've taken us through the, the lifetimes of the gurus. You have, you, have, you have shown us that turmoil that faced the Sikhs after Guru Gobind Singh Ji and Baba Banda Singh Bahadur. And then the glorious days of the empire of, of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and then the contemporary works that, that, that we see right now, and how Sikhs now identify themselves um, through art and culture. I think you know that 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 cannot be encapsulated better than through art. It is the window to our soul of our community. Um, one part that you mentioned earlier, um, I, I'm sorry if, I, if I'm, I'm dragging it out, but you know, it's just something that I've, it's so heartfelt, really. I, I really went through this process and it was, it was one that I, I do want to share. Um, one part that you mentioned, which, which also hit me was um, on, on, on Baba Nanak and that he's a real reflection of actually every single indiv individual's visualization. He's not, he's not going to be, he's not to be, to be encapsulated in only one image. He's every image to everybody. And that message of oneness is unbounded by religion. It is a universal message. Certain parts that I, I like from the collection that you have shown and the pictures that you have shown. And I'll start with what my, my son likes very much in the collection. Um, and he's... His main highlight when he went to see pieces of the collection at the, at the Sikhs in Singapore exhibition, and those who have not gone, I would really urge you, this is it's a, it's a marvelous exhibition in totality. Great work by Nalina and team and the Indian Heritage Center. Definitely go and see it. 
Um, but the one that he really liked is the turban helmet, and in the in the in the in in the exhibition, and and he and I I, I remember him seeing it, and he was run. He ran to me, and he said, "Dad, this is a brilliant invention because finally I have a helmet that I can wear on my head because I wear my patka and my top now." And and you know I know that no other helmet is going to fit me. Even the bicycle helmet doesn't fit me. But this one, they created one just for us. And so 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 I you know I you know it's it's one that I think will resonate with a lot of a lot of the Sikh males, uh, knowing that even in Singapore, because many of us go to national service, and so they would also resonate with that with that Sikh helmet. Um, the one that is my favorite in the collection that you have just shown, not in Singapore, but. You know, one that I thought maybe we should bring to Singapore at some point in time um, is the the painting which you said was your favorite too on five piercing, on five piercing, five piercing of Narangabad, and and that has actually Sonia a big a deep connection to Singapore because five piercing Narangabad was the predecessor of five Maharaj Singh, who is probably the patron saint saint of Sikh saint of Singapore because. He he was brought to Singapore as the first Sikh by the British, and he actually was was um, uh, 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 he passed away in Singapore in the Autumn Prison, and his memorial is still stands today, and so 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 that 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 piece actually is one that you know I I was blown away by because I that was the first time I was actually seeing it, and and you know it makes me also wonder about one thing that you know sometimes art enables us to find ourselves. And get lost at the same time, <laughs> and, and 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 I got lost in that picture because when you see the image, there's actually a picture of a of a younger person next to him, and he used to be shown in at least in the manuscripts that he used to be seated very closely to Pai Wee Singh when when the courts were, were were being done, and so so it could be I don't know it's a it's a matter of discovery for us, and definitely one one painting that would resonate with the community. Um, I, I thought the other important aspect that you shared was the reverence that the community gave to to Sri Guru Granth Sahib. And if you saw that that that, that picture of that miniature Sri Guru Granth Sahib, that's a one inch by one inch Sri Guru Granth Sahib. And 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 interestingly, it was made during the the world during World War One, and you had you had a lot of the Sikhs put it in their in their turbans. Because they were giving it respect, because they were bringing it into the into the battlefield, but they didn't want it to get dirty or soiled or or or, or have any disrespect to it, and they put it on the on on the, and placed it on their heads. The printing of that, incidentally, I just found that out very recently, was actually done in Germany prior to the war, and so so it was interesting that they were fighting the Germans, and they had and and they actually had printed it in in Germany as well. But the most important thing I think that you 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 ended off with. Um, that that I think we all as a community need to look at is that we need to keep the artworks alive. The contemporary artworks are now going to be and shaping our history for the centuries to come. Our kids, our grandkids, our future generations are going to view us. They are going to be the window of what we went through, what the what culture and civilization the the Sikh community now faces is going to be depicted through that art form. And so it's so important to to make sure that we nurture our new artists and we we promote them so that so that they they encapsulate and capture our our period of time and so that it can be there for for progeny. So so thank you thank you so much again Sonia I I I'm lost for words actually. Thank you, Simran. Uh, this is I think you very beautifully really summarized um, the the presentation even for me. And uh, you know some of the, uh, the the last point that you made about the Guru Granth Sahib, the miniature versions being printed in Germany, and then the World War happening, uh, it really points again to what I keep coming back to is like art is such a powerful medium to connect people. I mean, here were these opposite uh, communities, and they were connected through this one art form uh, which was the Guru Granth Sahib, the divine word, and uh, how beautifully that encapsulated that uh, sentiment. So really thank you for mentioning that and bringing that out. And uh, I loved how you also 
started when you said the quotation about people without knowledge of their heritage is like the tree without roots. Uh, it's, it's just so beautiful and poignant. And uh, one of the things I just wanted to point out was uh, you were struck by the painting of Pai Beer Singh, um, which I showed. And perhaps I think there are, these are different uh, personalities. Uh, this Pai Beer Singh was killed uh, right after in the fratricide that happened after Maharaja Ranjit Singh's death. Uh, so I don't, I think there is another Pai Beer Singh who comes to... No, no it, it, it's absolutely the same person. So um, Pai Beer Singh, Norangabad, gets you know, um, provided shelter to Kashmira Singh and Pashara Singh, who was the, yes, who was, yes. who was the sons. And, um, and he had uh, about 1,200 musketmen who also was, were there. His predecessor, Pai Saib Singh Bedi, was the one who gave the tilak to Maharaja Ranjit Singh and anointed him as the, the Shere Punjab. And, and, uh, and so after him, when Pai Beer Singh passes on, the next person who was, who was uh, the successor was uh, uh, Pai Nihal Singh, who then was known as, uh, more popularly known as Pai Maharaj Singh. And Pai Maharaj Singh was captured by the British and yes. then brought to Singapore in exile. Yes. So, yes. so that's so the connection that's to that. That, that, that the whole whole space so this is wonderful i mean we are we are talking about it you know from singapore from california you're talking about norangabad in india so thank you nalina for this wonderful opportunity and for uh, inviting us all so oh, um firstly thank you sonia for that wonderful wonderful journey through time um and um i think uh, in many ways as, um, as institutions that have really developed in the 20th and the 21st century, our challenge has been similar in trying to sort of, uh, you know, uh, acquire a significant collection of visual materials that helps us tell a story, a story that can have poignancy with members of the diaspora, with members of other communities who can see us as a place um, to learn more about uh, this diaspora or uh, with the source community for that matter. So, um, and I was really sort of just lost in the conversation that you and Simran were having, because I think for us, this is really a moment of pure joy. Um, and we see ourselves as an institution um, that is very well positioned to bring people of mutual interest and especially so uh, members of the diaspora together. Um, because I think there are several parallel journeys to ours in Singapore, and there are many learning points from how other communities in other parts of the world are trying to tell their stories. So I think for us, um, you know, when uh, putting together six in Singapore, for both Malvika and I, I think we were really trying to see where there might have been a parallel example that we can refer to when we are trying to tell the story of Sikhs in Singapore. And which is where, of course, we wanted to acknowledge the importance of really understanding Sikh history, because for the diaspora, it's such an important aspect of pride generation. Um, and we felt that both your collection, the Kapani collection, as well as Dr. Kanuja's collection really helped us do so. So um, firstly, maybe I would like to just pose a question, but before that, a short reminder to our audience who are with us that you can use the Q&A window to place your questions and we'll get to them soon. Um, but firstly, maybe Sonia, I think for us as an institution that's building our collection, I think we'd really like to know a little bit about the journey of you know, um, how this collection has come together, you know, uh, the challenges of putting together such a collection that Dr. Kapani faced, um, you know, whether it was some things that he might have inherited, but the bulk of it is pieces that he had identified and acquired. And what really do you see as the challenge for uh, people say like Simran, um, you know, who are uh, a younger sort of fold in the community and who have an opportunity to really see how they can play a role in keeping their heritage together, um, you know, for the future. Um, so, you know, maybe if we could learn a little bit from that experience of the Kapani collection, I think it would be very useful for all of us. So thank you, uh, Nalina. I will start with uh, one of the questions uh, you talked about, if and, and then if I don't cover it, please remind me later on. So about the, the collection of how it came about, the very interesting thing is that when Dr. Kapani was 
completely immersed in putting together this collection, at that time, there was no word such as sick art. It was just did not exist. It is the vision of Dr. Kapani, which is critical, which is I think the biggest challenge that many people will face is a lack of vision about that. It, people think it's about resources, it's about money and it's about uh, ability to do that. But more important is how you're able to visualize. Here is, there is no sick art, no one acknowledges it. Uh, people are just saying, oh, the only culture seeks no is agriculture. So that's where the narrative was put and how it came is another story. But to transcend that and to delve deep into it and start picking up artworks one by one. It is whether it is an auction, something comes up. Uh, he built his networks there. He brought uh, works from uh, Christie's, Bonham's, the other uh, British auction houses. Uh, through his network, people contacted him once they came to know that here is this person who is uh, interested. In fact, the Rani Jinda portrait, uh, Maharani Jind Kaur's portrait was uh, from a doctor here in the Bay Area himself. So he, then there are some he's bought from artists himself. He's, he's visited those artists, built contacts with them. You know, he's helped them in their journeys as well to grow the contemporary artists. So it has been picking things up lovingly with great passion, patiently over these 30, 40 years, and then putting it all on this table and stepping back and saying, hey, there, yes, there is an artistic heritage. So whoever says that there is no um, art for the Sikhs, even from the 17th uh, centuries, even in the uh, 18th centuries, more and more works are coming out now. And seeing his works, the work that he did with the museums, he started with uh, the Asian Art Museum was the first uh, exhibit here in the West uh, on Sikh art. Wonderful opportunity from there, the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, uh, Susan Strong was the curator there and how they worked together. And many of the museums really, the exhibits came to fruition because of the Kapani collection, that here they had a body of work they could take as a core for the exhibit and then build around it. And this, these exhibits has later on, I believe, inspired many other collectors because that's how those exhibitions, they have gone to that and uh, seen it for themselves. So that's, I think, the, the way the collection has been built with great love, great perseverance, and a few resources. So um, that's it, So, uh, which was the next question. Um, maybe just if I could just continue a little bit on that journey one with Simran. Um, Simran, I know that, you know, there are many young collectors in Singapore, whether it's just with Singurdita or others, um, you know, this fundamental idea that, you know, appealed to Dr. Kapani and one that he defined, that of seek art is definitely a moment of inspiration and drive for them to, you know, allocate whatever limited resources there might be to seeing how they can play a role in recovering their heritage. Um, if you would like to just share uh, an example that might come to your mind that would really play to this idea of uh, Dr. Kapani's as well. Yes, no, I, I mean, I think, I think the, that whole journey of discovery about your identity is one that that resonates the most, right? And and, and especially to young Sikh collectors, and you're right, there are quite a number of them who have emerged. I mean, a lot of their collections are green shoots, but but nonetheless, they they have they started to 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 bring them together. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus, and 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 also, I think from a community standpoint, we probably have done lesser in that space. There's a lot of understanding about the the stories and and uh, and, and 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 sort of also the philosophies of the Guru's time. But a lot of that after the Guru's time from the Missile period and the and Maharaja Ranjit Singh's period and after Maharaja Ranjit Singh has 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 sort of um, been be, and, and, and it could be because of the tumultuous times as well, right? So there's not there was not as much collections um, that, that were there. And so that there is there's a significant gap. And so a lot of the young collectors actually you see are, are trying to plug those gaps. 
they're coming in and looking at arms and armaments, they're looking at coinage, they're looking at textiles, um, and, they're, and they're trying to plug that gap in that, in that space. Um, I mean, on our side in, in, in Singapore, we've, we've, we've obviously worked very closely with the Indian Heritage Center for this exhibition. In parallel, we're also doing the same with a sister organization with the Asian Civilization Museum as well. And, 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 uh, and Sonia, like you said, I mean, it's, we, we've, we've, we've just put a, 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 a small seed, a very small seed display in the, in the faith and uh, beliefs gallery there. Um, and, and the reason was very simply because firstly, we need to educate ourselves that this, that Sikh art and Sikh heritage is important for the community. And, and we should be able to have a place where we can display it. And, uh, and then we need to connect with the, the wider diaspora and the networks to be able to bring in good collections and to be able to refresh that because ultimately that's how you're gonna be able to spread that message. And, and I think Dr. Kapani in his quote right at the end, it's, it's, not, it's not one just for our community. This, this, this rich heritage is actually for the world and we should be able to, to, to be able to display it in different um, uh, platforms. And, and I think that that's gonna be what um, the collectors are also looking for, right? They also are looking at ways that they can showcase their collections. Um, it's never gonna be just for themselves. And so we need to be able to create those platforms so that they can bring those collections. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think for us, uh, you know, that seek art serves the purpose of creating understanding and awareness definitely weighs, you know, very much high on our goals, especially in the context of a multicultural society like Singapore. Um, so just to sort of, uh, you know, move on to the next question, uh, Sonia, you showed an image of uh, one of you mentioned was uh, Dr. Kapani's favorite, a Sikh wedding procession image, right? And, uh, you know, the story that you had about, you know, look at this woman chiding the younger women, etc., reminded me of really our journey of discovering photographs in the collections of many, many families, right? I mean, uh, you know, the moment of wedding is one that has been documented perhaps better so than many other aspects of social life. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, you know, in terms of the Kapani collection, in telling the story of the diaspora and not so much the source community, um, you know, are there pieces um, there, whether it's photographic or whether it is contemporary works of art. And we'll come back to that uh, latter theme soon. But really, are there pieces that, you know, have been added to showcase our story, the story of the diaspora, and not only the story of the source community? So, uh, Nalina, I would say when Dr. Kapani started collecting, say this is uh, about 40 years ago, uh, like I said, there was no such thing as sick heart and uh, it was a difficult thing. And for him to put together everything and here give us a platform, a basis and a definition, which he said, sick heart is, he defined it as for Sikhs, by Sikhs or about Sikhs. And that, that is what motivated uh, his collection. And he built it up and I think the strength of the collection as it stands today is really the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, moving beyond that, uh, there was, uh, he, he collected works from a number of uh, artists, but most of them, when I look back, are Indian artists who are living in India and are really trying to tell um, the, the, the historical history, the cultural history, uh, of, of the period that they are living in, or in fact about the past, or Devinder Singh's work is very strong about, you know, imagery from um, the Great Sikh Women series. There are about 12, 13 paintings in that. He brings historical uh, women from Sikh history. Uh, then he has about the gurus, then there are on the missiles. So they're mostly, I would say, are concentrated on the historical aspect. Then Sukhpreet, uh, a number of works of his are in the collection as well, is on the cultural aspect, village life, you know, how life was in the villages, uh, et cetera. The Golden Temple, he depicts as a beautiful large painting which used to hang in Dr. Kapani's office of the Golden Temple. And it showed the, the, the Karseva happening there, which was the voluntary service to clean the Sarovar uh, remove the silt so that they remove the water, clean the silt at uh, the bottom and then. And that painting really was something uh, which I think personified Dr. Kapani because for him, devotion was not about, you know, worship. It was through service. 
So uh, he, if you use the, you know, this epithet, work is worship, but worship is not work. That's how he looked at it. And that painting shows devotion through seva. So his, uh, his personal interests were more, I think, in the historical and the cultural aspects. The works of Arpana Kaur also a uh, very strong representation are again, um, the histo uh, historical events, religious uh, events. Uh, then of course, the, the social uh, tragedy of 1984 is depicted in the uh, 19, wounds of 1984, very difficult painting, but he had that painting hanging right in his living room. Um, so I think that's uh, where it was. And it is, I believe, and I think it was a huge uh, basis that he's done for us, a platform he's built for us, and it is now for other collectors to carry the story forward because it doesn't end here. That was the beginning. And how do you take it forward is for the other collectors to work with uh, the living artists, you know, who are creating works which represent our times. Uh, the contemporary artists, uh, whether they are from America, from Canada, wherever in the world. And I'm very, very pleased that there are so many artists that are coming up who are taking this tradition forward, bringing in new energy, new perspective, new mediums uh, as well into, into these works. So that is a lead. I think the doors open for you and me now to carry the story forward and to really create what the next, when we look 500 years from now and say, oh, what was done, you know, we have to create things for the next 500 years. And perhaps if I might just add a little bit of an anecdote, I think, you know, in our early conversations, we did talk about this stamp that, you know, marks the incident of Komagatamaru, which is a very, very important turning point in the history of the Sikh diaspora and a moment of connection between North America, uh, the Sikhs in North America, and those in Singapore. So perhaps that was Dr. Kabani's way of leaving a clue as to the importance of the diaspora's uh, you know, story needing to be told as well. So um, yeah, definitely, I think there are perhaps surprises within the collection uh, as well. Now, in terms of contemporary art, I noticed that there's a question uh, in the Q&A window saying, there's a painting of a lady behind you, Sonia, can we know more about it? I think they're making reference to the lady with the yellow dupatta, but uh, this does tie in with um, you know, our own intent to ask you a little bit about, uh, you know, the role of women, uh, you know, in the diaspora now, especially say Sikh artists who are women and how they are actually making an attempt to depict the important role of women in the diaspora. And of course, I'm making specific reference to the artists that both you and us have actually had encounters with quite recently. So at the exhibition, we feature four illustrations by Canadian Sikh artist, Kirat Kaur. And the one that I quite like is the one of a woman who is shown in absolute, you know, uh, uh, in rebellion to a uh, sort of a tradition. She's somebody who is at one a moment, you know, riding uh, her vehicle with vegetables that she's marketed, but she's also got her graduation hat on her head. So very clearly showing her in an empowered moment, taking charge of her life. Um, and I think artists like these are really sort of telling you about the underlying change in the diaspora's women, uh, you know, going from more traditional roles to professional or just sort of very independent roles. And I think Simran will agree here as well that the role of women in the Singapore Sikh community has changed over the last 50 years. So Sonia, I mean, if you would, uh, you know, show us a little bit of the portrait of Bibi Harnamkor and maybe of the others, because of course I realized that all of them are to do with women and you would share it uh, with our audience as well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's wonderful. I mean, I, uh, I just, um, the works behind me, uh, these are the two paintings that you see, uh, one in the blue with the white border and the one right above it. These are works by Kirat Kaur. Uh, they were exhibited at the Triton Museum, the, the contemporary art exhibit that we had in 2019. And I feel very honored to have these pieces from her. And they tell, for example, the Hernampur uh, portrait was my entry 
into trying to look at Canadian Sikh history, but through a woman's narrative. Now, she was one of the first Punjabi women to migrate to Canada. Uh, early 1900s, she comes to Vancouver, and uh, but she dies very soon. In a few years, she dies, and an obituary is published in the newspaper. And this is the image, the photograph that is published, which Kirat then digs out from the archives, and she creates this portrait. And she has this beautiful angels uh, uh, drawn above her portrait, which kind of giving her respect. They're showering petals over her. So it is through this work that her Naam Kaur becomes alive in my, in my memory. Otherwise, I had no memory of any named woman, Sikh woman in, in Canadian Sikh history. So it took a woman artist to dig this out for us. So that's, that's tremendous. And uh, then the other painting is also, there is one by Rupi Tut, uh, which is the lady in red. Very, it's a mix of the contemporary and the traditional. The style is very traditional. It's a woman in a Pahari style and she's looking at the churning waters of the rivers, but she has her hand raised in a victory sign. And so that's really is somebody from my generation. We are, you know, we've got our feet in two boats. We, we are older generation as well and navigating new cultures and new aspects. So that really speaks very well to me. Then another painting that is there of the elderly woman with her hand raised, the large canvas, represents the farmer's protest that is happening in India at this moment. It is now in its seven month when the farmers are uh, protesting for their land rights. And this is again, the woman's story that the artist has taken. His name is Gurpreet Singh, he's from Batinda. He's very much involved in the agitation and the morchas. And uh, so he has taken the, during the women's, um, uh, International Women's Day, some 50,000 women showed up on the borders of Delhi uh, for the protests. And this is one of those portraits in which how this uh, protest has changed how women in Punjab are looking at themselves and how even others are looking at them. They're really feeling very empowered part of the, of the protest and not just there because somebody asked them to come and somebody, uh, you know, there was one thing from the Supreme Court of India uh, in December which uh, advised the farmers that please send the women and children back. It's not safe for them. And the women were, were indignant to hear this. They were like so upset. This is, we toil in the fields with the, with the men. We are farmers too. It's not, what are we then, you know? And I personally also, when I say the word farmer, the image comes of a man. It never comes as a woman's image. But this protest has changed that for me. And now when I say, yes, they are farmers too. And they're... So this wall behind me, I like to joke that this is my power wall. <laughs> you know, it, 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 I look at it and it inspires me uh, every time. So, um, so what, coming to the contemporary artists, what I feel that it is the artistic achievements of a community that are the true markers of a healthy, thriving, thinking, and evolving community. And these creative endeavors, they are reminders to us as Sikhs and the wider world that beyond our agricultural, professional, entrepreneurial success, is our 550 years of artistic heritage. And I think it is these artists, the contemporary artists who drive the conversations, whether it is through films, books, paintings, sculptures, photographs, they are the ones who are really are the face to the world for the Sikh community. And they mine the past and they are presenting the continuity between the present and the past. So the celebration of our artists is just the way in which we will continue to tell the story. Whether it is in Singapore or it is in the US. US we've had 130 years of uh, old Sikh history in the US, but much of it is still invisible. 
So our arts, culture, literature, traditions, they are still missing from the public spaces. And I think that's uh, a very important role that institutions like yours, the Indian Heritage Center, has really stepped up to fill in those spaces. And uh, another bigger aspect, um, uh, I'm sorry, if I'm going on too long, just let me know. Uh, you know, I think uh, as immigrant families, uh, the children from immigrant families, no matter who, which community it is, they often have uh, difficult and many times unanswered questions around their identity. Who am I? Where am I from? What is home? These are questions that they grapple with. And I have experienced this, not personally, uh, but with my own uh, son, who's now 18 years old. And, and I've, but I've also experienced the transforming moment when my child has gone to a museum and he has seen paintings and art which he could relate to on a cultural level. And it has been a validating and an empowering moment. A moment when that child takes ownership of their heritage and he does it with pride. And this is the role that museums who put together these narratives and they help us and our children get answers to these essential explorations of identity. So thank you very much for uh, you know, your efforts to bring this show, uh, to put it up in Singapore because it is tremendous. Thank you, Sonia. But I'm going to ask Simran, um, A, do you think that uh, we are answering some of those questions? And then B, I just wanted to ask you, because you yourself have been quite behind the scenes about, you know, uh, bringing to the forefront some artistic talent. Of course, the chosen media here was film. And um, I think film is, again, another important, uh, you know, medium that connects Sikh diaspora across the world. So uh, perhaps if you could tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you know in Singapore have changed, uh, you know, the perception of Sikh history uh, through the medium of film, and uh, maybe you could mention some of these uh, young minds behind this as well, so our audience knows. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, I, I mean I think the, the 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 question with regards to the contemporary artists um, first. I mean I think that there's a lot more that can be done. You know, I I, I feel we we as a community have. Um, uh, not focus as much attention to um, the art and the heritage, and, and more importantly, to understand that there are different mediums of, uh, of con contemporary artworks, right? It's not only one, 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 one form, and you need to be all encompassing and you need to be broad based in order to, to have thriving artists. And I think, Sonia, you mentioned about the fact that, you know, it's, it's about the, 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 the thriving creatives that actually shows the vibrancy of the community. And I, and I think it's important that that, that, com that that Sikh diaspora take the lead in that because that, they, they, they have different different stories to tell, right? And, and different angles. It's not only from the source community, it's also how they have assimilated in their different communities, different countries. Um, and, and then that stories that amalgate together um, in, in, uh, and, and I think the, in, one thing that the Indian Heritage um, uh, Center exhibition of Sikhs in Singapore did is also not only, not only the, the art and the culture, but also the food <laughs> and, and, so, and, and the changes in the food that, that occurred um, as, as they went to different countries and, and, uh, and the change uh, and, and how they had to assimilate with the, with, with, with the, 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 the sort of a, a cuisine of, of, of that particular geography. Um, so, so I mean, I think I think that's one that the diaspora will need to pay particular attention to, right? It is it is going to be uh, one that if we don't do it right now, we will lose that momentum for the future generations, and so that's that's a, a, a an impending need of the hour. The second part of that question was on films and different um, modalities that have been have been used and and are coming up in Singapore, and and I think film has become one that um, you know has been has taken a particular uh, uh, form just because it, it unites and it is able to to in a very in a, in, a, in a format where people can absorb much more um, the background the, the 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 reflections and what the future aspirations are in 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 one setting 
And so, 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 so one thing that we, we looked at, and I mean, a personal project that I worked on and, and looked at uh, with, with a very, very talented young director, uh, Upni Ko uh, Nagpal, who is a, is a, is a, um, woman, a Sikh woman film director and, and now uh, director of the award-winning uh, The Saint Soldier documentary, was to look at our history. And, and it all stemmed from that same question, that Sonia, you said. What, what brought us here? Who was the first person that actually came to Singapore? Who was that first Sikh that came to Singapore? How, how did the community actually arrive here? And that question then spurred an entire documentary. And, uh, and uh, you know, and it is sort of uh, became one that now is the source of truth. It's one that can, has researched what happened and how, how that person came together and came to Singapore, just like how you have that picture of uh, Bibi Harnamkor, this is this became this creates the anchor um, to the community itself, um, and then it creates offshoots research now into what 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 was the 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 the, the situation that person was in when he was when when he was in Singapore or what what how did that person impact the rest of the community as they shaped on and wh whether there is there's still a linkage back and there's now literature and there's there's other discovery that occurs so that is that is the power of all these artworks. They create offshoots of further discovery, further research that enriches the community. Um, I think other, other, other uh, upcoming uh, Sikh talent in Singapore, I mean, uh, uh, Sarabjit from the YSA just very recently did uh, 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 a film on the Sikh road, which was also in, in interesting. He did it very uh, in collaboration with the National University, which is also important. You need to be able to look at the academic uh, side of, of the community and how it evolves over periods of time in, um, in, uh, in Singapore. And also capturing of the oral history uh, tradition because some of these people are not going to be there in the future. And, 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 and their stories are going to be the ones that, that we um, are able to have a window of what they experienced when they came into, into Singapore and there was no other community members and there was no Sikh community as such at that point in time. Um, and, and then there are others that are now looking at specific periodic historical events. I mean, I think uh, Guruji even started looking at um, his own discovery of his past and his village. And then he started looking at, at uh, the partition itself. And so, so all of that becomes very interesting uh, 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 pieces. And one that you mentioned earlier, of uh, Amardeep Guruji, who's also here, and he's embarking on a, on a colossal uh, uh, initiative and endeavor on, on, uh, on, on a, uh, a multi-episodic documentary on Guru Nanak's travels, the, the Udasis of Guru Nanak and over nine different countries, which he has, he has put in that, in that 24 uh, episode um, uh, documentary that he's going to put it, be putting out. And that's, that's going to be a, a source of, of not only knowledge, but message, not only for the Sikh community, but, but the world in, 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 in itself. And, and all of that coming from, from a, a tiny red dot. Uh, and, and, and contributing to the to the Sikh diaspora, you know, I, I'm very excited by by a lot of those initiatives. Thank you, Simran. Um, and uh, I saw a question pop up earlier, but it has disappeared. But um, yeah, I think it was uh, from Sarabjit. Um, but I'm just going to sort of uh, link that up with something that I had uh, in mind myself. Um, you know, we have often used art as a medium to plug our understanding in the past. Uh, you know, of the past rather. Um, so, you know, perhaps by commissioning or by, you know, identifying works that'll help us reconstruct a moment of the past. But how do we see art helping us, uh, you know, cope with the future? You know, um, is there a way that, the, uh, that art as a medium can be used to say address uh, uh, questions of identity that might be challenging or sensitive? Uh, are there ways that art can help people, uh, you know, um, cope with matters that might arise in the future from a community perspective, especially that of a minority community. So, um, you know, are there moments that this could be done? And uh, with that also, I have a second part to the question in that, you know, museums like us or, in, or collect, uh, collecting foundations like yours, uh, Sonia, I mean, we might often be posed with acquisitions that from a community perspective might be seen as sensitive. In, you know, a case in point being, say, the Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji, uh, you know, because it is, it, it is definitely impossible for us to, you know, have, uh, have it in our collection for display because it is something that is 
uh, you know, sacred. Uh, it is very much the living guru being revered by the community. So are there other such instances that might pose us a challenge to telling the story? And can we then use the aid of, uh, you know, other mediums of AV or, you know, ways of documenting intangible cultural heritage? to contextualize uh, you know, objects uh, that we might not be able to bring in in person. And I was just wondering if you might have some examples to share with us and if Simran could respond to that, because you know, at the end of the day, when we're looking at seek art, it's important for us to acknowledge that most of it is religious or ritual based. And uh, you know, there is a very fine line. So you know, from the perspective of CSGB, maybe Simran, after Sonia responds, you could as well, yeah. So. Uh, Nalina, I mean, uh, Sikhat, you, you mentioned about, I'll take the latter part of it first, uh, of the different uh, uh, aspects of art that can be, uh, that are problematic to explain or to display in museums. One of the most trying uh, concerns uh, that, uh, that I feel is at the moment is conservation of the monuments. A huge, huge problem, whether it is in Pakistan, whether it is in India, uh, the frescoes, we did a show with uh, the Guru Har Sahai frescoes, which are in, uh, in, in Punjab in India. Uh, then the monuments that are in Pakistan, there is the Noni Hal Singh Havelis. There are so many others which have, uh, fabulous uh, works of art on their walls. Amardeep uh, Singh has really documented this whole process in both his books and he has also will cover and in the two films that he did, uh, Peering Warrior and, um, and the other one. So that is something which is very, you can't display that in a museum. Uh, and that's where AI or, uh, you know, how do you, there are some museums that will do this immersive experience in which through um, the, the digital means you get a feeling of what the original was. And I kind of look at even the, the statues, the Bamiyan statues, Buddha statues in Afghanistan, uh, which we have lost. Uh, so those, those are, are is, is a field that really needs critical attention whether it is in Patiala, the Killas over there, whether it is in India, whether the Gurdwaras, uh, which have been broken down, marbleized. Uh, so maintaining that architectural heritage uh, is one challenge which museums have. And uh, whether doing the photography and recreating those spaces and keeping it at least documented uh, for eternity. So that was one uh, that came to my mind right away. Then your other mention was about uh, how artists are navigating contemporary times. So whether it is uh, some artists have been working on, you know, how COVID has, has uh, affected them. What is it that they are seeing around them? So those Sukhpreet is creating a painting at the moment uh, on this theme of how the Sikh community has responded in real time to the COVID crisis that have, uh, which is ongoing in India, sadly. And uh, then there is uh, Rupi Tut, um, the Bay Area artist. And one of her works, uh, which is the machinery of oppression was very recently acquired by the Asian Art Museum. And that is a work uh, which really is again, telling a contemporary story. It's, uh, it does not get limited by the Sikh perspective. Yes, we are part of this bigger story. And she talks about colonialism in that, uh, in that piece of how it is fed through the common people, uh, the burdens that they bear, how the appropriation of cultures happens. And then she brings in the political scene of what is happening in America, whether it is the Democratic Party or the Republicans. It's not taking a, a biased view from any political side. But as an artist, what is it that she's seeing how this situation of the past is, is also visible in what is the present today. So that's a powerful piece, which I hope will go on view very soon uh, at the Asian Art Museum. So in this way, like Kirit's work is also very, she is uh, taking her lived experiences. These are honest, lived, sincere, works in which what the artists are themselves dealing with 
some of her works deal with mental health issues. And uh, so portraying that difficult subject, which is very difficult for even uh, for our community to address. You know, we, we have, um, there is no acknowledgement of these things uh, within the community. These they don't show shine a, a good light on it. So we don't want to talk about those. So some artists are bringing in those. So I think the artists are really uh, working on difficult issues, which might be very difficult to talk about. Sometimes arts can speak the unspeakable. And through that, you can shine a light on that. Rupi Kaur, who's the uh, author, through her works, you know, and through her book, Milk and Honey, and how she has um, brought attention to this aspect within the community, which was not. So these a number of artists, I think, are working uh, all over, whether it's in Canada, uh, I'm aware of in UK, in uh, America, India. I'm not very uh, familiar with works uh, happening in South Asia, in your part of the world, but I hope this is a starting point uh, for that as well. So I'm very excited about uh, how the artists are. And they really are, I think, our calling card or a visiting card to the world for the Sikh communities, because that's how we are known in the world through their works, whether it's films, books, paintings, music, dance, choreography, sculpture, all of these are artists. So I mean, even our modern news, you know, which is brought, it is brought through journalists, through imagery that comes, and that's how we know about what's happening. Thank you, Sonia. Definitely, I think art, whether it is now or in the future, will have this potential uh, to address issues that might be unspeakable otherwise. So uh, definitely very well put. And if uh, Simran, I could ask you to maybe respond to the you know, uh, earlier question as well about uh, you know, collecting uh, Sikh art. And if you wanted to add on to the second question as well. Sure. No, I, mean, I, think, I think you mentioned an uh, important part of it. I mean, um, you know, one, one, one delicate uh, and fragile part of, of C card is really a lot of the manuscripts and the lit literature. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to also display because of the care that is required and not all um, uh, places can, can, can accommodate to that, right? And, and so, so there's a need to, to start thinking about newer solutions. And I think Sonia touched about it as well that you know, there is, there's, there's a need to look at digitization and, and being able to, to look at uh, uh, items and artifacts uh, with the technologies that we have. I mean, there, there's an ability to now create 3D imagery and, uh, and uh, AR to be able to even experience the manuscript um, um, in, on, on your phone uh, or, or your mobile devices. And so, so that's, that's the way to, to, I would say, to capture a lot of these uh, very sensitive manuscripts, um, and and that you cannot display whether it's because of of a specific protocol or because they are fragile and cannot be handled with that with the adequate care. And so, so I think that's something that 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 needs to be looked at in terms of investments. And you know, even from a from a, a CSGB standpoint, you know, we 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 were so heartened by the the number of collection uh, items that have come up during this. Six in Singapore uh, uh, exhibition. I mean, more than four hundred fifty, and and in the catalog over a thousand of sorts. And and, and a lot of that um, uh, items, and 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 especially those that are manuscripts or or or, or literature or, or documentation. Um, you know, the only way they're going to be able to stand the test of time is if they are digitized. And we have a repository where where that information can be kept and preserved, so that you know when we have keen minds and creatives looking at research, they have material to go to. They have, they have, they have the source uh, documents and they have the source literature to, to actually look at and say, oh yeah, you know, I, this, this is something so interesting that, that we as a community might have overlooked and now we need to, to, to find out and tell that story. Um, I think the other, the, other, the other part that Sonia touched upon is really on the, on the preservation of architecture as well. I mean, I think that's, that's one that we have lost a lot um, due to significant historical moments from the partitions to, to other, other uh, events uh, or, or, dis or natural disasters as well. And, and now a lot of that is self-inflicted by, by, by means of modernization and we, we are taking, taking the, the history apart. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we need to think about that. I mean, one, 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 uh, in, 
one 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 aspect of that 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 the uh, interesting anecdote on the Singapore side, which which comes to mind is how uh, Ishwinder, when he looked at the heritage trail, started looking at at all the all the uh, Sikh uh, 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 models and uh, uh, of the of the uh, watchmen that were put in the in the graves because they were going to they're going to be exhumed in Singapore and they and they, and they were uh, part of uh, of our heritage and so he he recorded all of this imagery in uh, in different parts of Singapore and 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 now that's intangible right because some of that has gone and and uh, and if he didn't put that record in place. We, we we probably would have lost that that entire insight and that entire history as well. So so that's that's the important part of it of how we can preserve some of that. And I, I know one of that one of that uh, statue is also on display at the Six in Singapore exhibition. And so it was one that people should see because it's interesting. You know, that's a a, a cross cultural piece where you have Sikh gods for a Chinese grave <laughs> and and and, uh, and they're protecting them in the nether and in the nether lives as well as they protected them in 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 person so so i, I mean i think those are things that i i feel uh, are, are important for us to preserve i in my mind manuscripts and digitization is probably the way to go in order to look at sensitive material thank you simran and uh, thank you so much sonia if i might uh, ask malvika to help us wrap the session up but before that i mean um, you know our heartfelt gratitude to sonia for making time for us after hours in california of course and uh, for being with us for such a generous amount of time and i know that there were a few more questions in the q a window but i hope that uh, you know they will of course uh, you know get a copy of the kapani collection book and find out more about whether it's arms and armament or whether it is about some of the paintings inspiring contemporary artists and of course simran for being with us throughout the journey of this monthly webinar series and for being such an important voice uh, you know that brings us the community perspective every time so thank you to both and over to Malvika. I'd uh, also like to add on my thanks to both uh, Sonia and Simran for this wonderful riveting session. I think uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought, uh, uh, the audience included. Um, so I'd like to conclude today's session um, by uh, letting everybody know that this is part of our monthly series that goes on until September in conjunction with the Sikhs in Singapore, A Story Untold special exhibition, which is on at IHC until the 30th of September this year. Um, we also have a film series that we conduct uh, monthly and the next in the film series will be on um, 10th of July. Uh, you can stay uh, updated on all of our uh, programs with the exhibition on IHC's Facebook and PTIX page. Uh, thank you again for spending your morning with us and Sonia, of course, for spending much of your evening with us as well. And uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>